So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is David Dawson. I'm director of the museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this online talk, which is going to be about uh, Revilius in Wiltshire. Um, now, I have to say, the real expert on this is, of course, James Russell, who is the guest curator for the amazing exhibition we've got at the museum. So I'm going to do a very poor imitation of of him, but what I'm I'm going to really focus in on Revilius's links with with Wiltshire. So just very briefly, Eric Revilius, um, the artist, this is a photo of him uh, with fellow students at the Royal College of Art. He um, grew up in, uh, in Eastbourne and he was obsessed, he loved the chalk downlands of um, Sussex, Kent and Wiltshire. And he was very, and he um, lo loved to capture them using watercolour. Now, he trained at the, uh, initially at the uh, College of Art in Eastbourne, then at the Royal College of Art, where he was very much working on um, the more commercial side of um, the, the focus there. And he particularly became known for his wood engravings. But while he was there, he studied the work of a number of 19th century artists, including um, Cousins and um, Cotman and Prout. And those really inspired him to create his landscapes. And so um, here's uh, one from the exhibition from 1927. So this was when he, he painted this when he was uh, where are we, 24 um, and shows the, uh, the Downs at Fell, uh, which is just about just uh, close to Lewis. And it has a real trademark, both from the 19th century watercolorist colorist, and particularly from him, of something modern in the foreground to act as a foil for the, for the timeless landscape that was beyond, in this case, the fence. Um, as a wood engraver, he was using a technique of um, white on black, which was rather different to the way that most wood engravings were being done at the time, and actually harked back to Buick from the um, early 19th century. And by, by being a wood engraver, he was really exploring the use of texture. And you can see here, um, a boy collecting bird's eggs. Um, the model for this was actually one of his friends who was spent hours perched on the back of a sofa. But perhaps at the downs at the back, you can see the way that the texture of the hills has been create, uh, created to give a sense of depth to the, uh, to the work. And he followed this with, um, by, in, the in 1927, well, sorry, 1929, he was commissioned to do a calendar, an almanac, by a major uh, American type company. And this was him well on his way to being a well-established artist. And you see here, uh, Taurus um, and uh, the Wilmington long man. He thought maybe it was a, a woman. There was a lot of debate at the time, very wide hips. And you see the stars reflected in the dew pond. Um, this is the, the, um, the great bear and the sign, that sign of 20, the 20th century, in a timeless landscape. But the story of um, Revilius in Wiltshire come, dates to 1932. And this is Orr House, which is found on the road between Pusey and Marlborough. And this belonged to Sir Geoffrey Fry, who was the, um, the private secretary to the prime minister at the time, Stanley Baldwin. And Revilius met Fry when he had just finished the work on his major commission, which was that of um, working on uh, the refectory, the dining room of Morley College, which was a, a college based in East London. He'd worked on this with his friend and fellow student at the Royal College, Edward Borden. And together they'd created an amazing um, mural um, and this was being opened by the Prime Minister. And he met Sir Geoffrey Fry a few days beforehand just to go through what the arrangements were, were to be. Sir Geoffrey Fry was a real patron of the arts um, and of artists. And this is the house he had bought, and he'd rather extended it rather by adding the two wings that you see on each, each side. These were designed by William Clough Ellis, who was rather better known um, as an architect for doing. Um, Port Merion, which of course was the, um, uh, the setting of the 1960s 
prisoner series. Absolutely iconic, an amazing place to go and visit. Here, however, his architecture was rather more restrained. And this gives you an, an idea of where uh, Orr House is. The M, this is taken from our website where we've got a map showing these locations that you can explore, um, uh, explore later. So devices here with a big red M for museum. This is Orr on the road between Pusey leading up to Marlborough. And he painted a number of works while he was at the house. And this is um, a page taken from Country Life showing the, the house as it had been, um, as it'd been extended, showing the amazing gardens, looking down the, an avenue, looking away from the house. And here that entrance to the house with um, a parade of trees leading to it. It's absolutely stunning, well worth a visit. It is open or it has been open during the, um, for the National Garden Scheme. And if you do get an opportunity, it's well worth going to see. Um, rather nice cake as well, I hasten to add. And Revilius and his wife, Terza, Terza Garwood, visited, um, were invited to, to stay at Orr House by Sir Geoffrey in 1932. And he painted a number of watercolours in and around the area, um, which were commissioned by Sir Geoffrey Fry. This is the first I, I want to show, which is, and a number of these are on, on, in a private collection, which was not available uh, to us for the um, for our exhibition. So they're in a private collection. And this is the view of Rainscombe, which is in the hills above uh, Orr, on the um, between Orr and Marlborough. And you see here the sweep of the downs. And interestingly, just on the um, on the, the skyline, you can see a bank and a ditch, which are um, part of an Iron Age hill fort, which is on um, above Rainscombe. And the wonderful thing about these watercolours is you can actually go and see the locations um, that, of, that he paint, from which he painted. Um, in fact, the location where Revilius painted was probably just there on the edge of the slope. It, there's a barbed wire fence, so obviously I didn't uh, trespass, but uh, that would have given you a slightly wider view. And you can see here, here the bowl of the downs. Um, in the bottom was Rainscombe House, and on the skyline you can see there, um, we can see here the bank and ditch of the hill fort, which lies just there. And it's amazing to be able to stand in the, um, uh, the same location as Rebilius. And as a close-up, you can visit this yourself. This is the road from Pusey to Marlborough. You go up the hill to, uh, towards Marlborough, and at the very top of the downs, there's a returning on the right little track. You can park and then walk up. Um, it's only a couple of hundred yards until you see that amazing view here of the bowl of Rainscombe with the house at the bottom. The second one I want to talk about is Hewish Gap. And this is rather different and looking down into the Vale of Pusey. So Pusey will be down here somewhere. And you see the banks and ditches on the top of the hill. Um, the one that you see in the foreground, which is the same as that, is a late, probably a late Bronze Age, um, uh, what's called a Wessex linear. In other words, a ranch boundary. In the late Bronze Age, um, with a deteriorating climate, the, uh, the economy moved towards herding of cattle. And so these ranch boundaries were laid out across the landscape. And again, you can stand in the same place that Revilla stood. And you can see here the, the bank and the ditch in front of you um, here, so in front of us here and there. You can see the, the way that he has sort of use the textures and the, the banks and the ditches to give that interest in the foreground. And this is one example where you start to see very much a sort of a layering, um, just as he did in his wood engravings, using the def definition of this slope here and the different textures of the grass, the different directions here, sweeping curves, 
they're much straighter lines. And those give a real sense of depth to his watercolors. And again, very easy to go and visit. You can go to the village of Hewish, park up by the church, follow the track up the hill, and then turn right at the top. Very straightforward. And this view uh, is one that I'd not seen until recently. This is the Marlborough Downs, as it's called. And this is from the house at Orr. Um, in the background, you can see the North Wessex Downs. And um, that hill is very is the one above Alton Barnes. Alton Barnes' white horse would be hidden just behind that tree. And that's what's the Neolithic Long, long, uh, Neolithic long Barrow called Adam's Grave. And you're looking here down the, the uh, across the garden. Here's this, here would be the swimming pool. And looking down across uh, between the trees down towards the ground, uh, uh, towards the downs. And this is that same view today. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to visit a couple of weeks ago with a group um, I was taking around showing them the locations that uh, Revilius had painted. And you can see there the avenue of trees the downs beyond, um, and this view is taken is from uh, the terrace outside the house, whereas Revilius's is, is from one of the guest bedrooms on the third floor, which gives a very different view of the landscape. And probably the most famous one from Orr House is this one called Strawberry Nets. And the, one of the most remarkable things about this is the way in which he treated the uh, the netting um, above the strawberries and you see the detail in that and again that goes back to the painstaking technique he had learnt in his wood engraving with his wood engraving he, he made a very uh, good commercial living um, and became very well known for it and he was taking that skill and that attention to detail into his watercolors and again you can see the downs in the background. Now, I rather stupidly had thought that the uh, the strawberries were in this area behind the wall at uh, Orr House, and the view was across the front of the house towards the downs above Hewish, where the previous, where one of the earlier views was. However, having spoken to uh, the, the son of the house, I'm afraid this is rather a poor photo because we were here in the very late afternoon. In fact, the view is looking westwards towards Adam's grave. And in this view, Adam's grave is hidden literally behind that bit of the tree. And you can see here the tree on the left is the tree that Revilius painted. And here the wall with the vines is the wall that's running alongside that track. Unfortunately, the strawberry beds have become compost heaps, which is slightly different. And then the last one he, um, uh, that he painted at the, um, during this expedition, and he was really prolific, um, he visited twice in 1932, was this view of uh, the Wiltshire landscape. Um, and it shows the very famous red van, uh, post office van, which was added, added after he'd done the rest of the picture. But again, you have the van, the sign, and the marching telegraph um, posts as being the, um, the intrusion of the 20th century into a timeless landscape. And this picture shows is, is of the road between Pusey and Devizes. So the line of trees here are the, is the Kennison Avon Canal. And with the eye of faith at the background here is uh, the town of Devizes. Um, rather difficult to photograph these days because you get uh, squashed by traffic on the road. But this is the turning from, from that road down to Stanton St. Bernard. And this is one place where you can see that he um, used a little bit of artistic license because in the 1930s, the field here just beyond the crossroads was actually um, allotments. And the this photograph unfortunately doesn't really give you the sense of the hills the the downs on the right hand side which really do overlook um this this junction 
So that is halfway between uh, Pusey, well, but essentially between Pusey and Devizes. It's just below the horse at Alton Barnes. And then in 1935, he was starting to look at sort of more in, in also at other areas of the downs. He'd been in the meantime, he'd moved to Essex and was exploring the landscape there. Uh, but in 1935, he was staying with a friend, uh, Peggy Angus at Furlongs, which is um, not far from Lewis um, in down in Sussex. And again, picking up on this motif of uh, the 20th century in a timeless landscape, you can see the barbed wire fence and the, this idea of the road leading to interesting places that you want to explore and this real sense of the downs. And this was really quite an interesting time because in um, the 1920s, a chap called Henry Massingham had published a book called Downland Man. And this was, and he was really interested in the link between the archeology span and the landscape um, and, and the downs, particularly on the chalk. Now, he, his ideas were a little, um, shall we say, interesting because he thought there was a direct link between Egypt and um, the, what we can call, it was, the, the name wasn't uh, coined until, until Stuart Piggott wrote the semin his seminal article in 1939 of what we call the Wessex culture of Stonehenge and Avebury and the amazing burials in the landscape which feature in our museum. But in 1926, he published Downland Man and that had a real impact. He became a really well-known travel writer and the sort of modern contemporary, modern equivalent is probably Bill, Bill Bryson. And archeology span started to have a real renaissance and started to be really exciting. There were lots of new developments. One of the key ones was that of the um, the introduction of or the use of aerial aerial photography and its impact on archaeology. A couple of key people here: Alexander Keeler, um, heir to the Keeler Marmalade fact, uh, uh, fortune, who had been um, worked in the intelligence corps in the First World War, analysing aer aerial photographs, and realised that alongside the trenches and railway lines, he could see ancient monuments. And on the right hand side, OGS Crawford, who worked for the Ordnance Survey and was responsible for putting um, archaeological sites and antiquities onto OS maps. And together in 1928, they worked on a book called Wessex from the Air, which <laughs> rather did what it said, says on the tin. And they were able to show these amazing photographs and relate them to the archaeology that people could see in the landscape, giving a completely different view. But this also meant that archaeology was becoming really quite um, a popular subject. And Alexander Keeler was then um, very active in excavating at Avebury. He realized there were lots of the megalithic stones had been, re had been buried um, during the 17th century. So he re-excavated them and had them reset in their original positions particularly um, in the southwest and um, northwest quadrants of Avebury and the West Kennet Avenue. And here is one from the West Kennet Avenue being re-erected. And Paul Nash, who had, um, Paul had taught um, Rivolius at the Royal College of Art, was also was inspired by these, by the archeology span and by this sort of rediscovery and he, he created Landscape of the Megaliths in 1937, one of, one of a number of works he created as a result of what was going on in the Avebury landscape. He found it absolutely fascinating. And you can see here his, the way he's painted the, um, the stones of the West Kettent Avenue, which by, at this point had only just been re-erected. So there was a sort of new, new approach to archeology. span and also in the news was Sir Mortimer Wheeler, who was a one-man time team, who was excavating at Maiden Castle and creating a huge stir in the newspapers, um, sort of illustrated uh, magazines, um, and even in cinema, cinema newsreels at the time. 
And it's in this context that Paul Nash was asked by Shell to write a book about Dorset and to encourage people to explore the county. Now, Shell weren't doing this out of um, altruism. What they were trying to do was to sell petrol. And so they had created this whole series of, or well, they commissioned a whole series of posters highlighting places to go and visit in the countryside. And of course, then you then needed to buy petrol. Now, this view was not by Revilius, but it might have been. And so it was in this context that in 1937, Revilius was exploring parts of the Wiltshire countryside with Nash, and he lighted upon this scene in um, eastern Wiltshire. Um, very interesting part of the world, one that uh, <laughs> I have to say I hadn't been to until I was trying to find the location, or until I was finding the location for this painting. This is in the very east of the county, um, and, um, uh, and this is called Chute Causeway, C-H-U-T-E. And this is a place, the, the, um, the road you see in front of you is, is metal but it's on the line of a Roman road. The Roman road should have come in a nice straight line, sort of slap bang through this valley, but for obvious reasons, because the valley is too steep, it took a circuit around the top of the, uh, uh, along the top of the ridges. And so it's really unusual situation where you get um, a, a, a Roman road that isn't straight. And so Revilius, chose this view. It, interesting, it had been highlighted in a, a motoring book uh, published in 1905 as being a particularly splendid view. So you sort of wonder whether he was doing this, he did this painting partly to try and persuade Shell to give him a commission of doing the illustrations for one of their Shell guides. In the, in the event, the Shell guide for Wiltshire was completed by John Piper. And this is where the causeway is situated, right down in the very east of the county. It's almost in Hampshire. And the Roman road led from um, the, um, the, the Roman town just outside Swindon through Connetio, just to the east of Marlborough, was heading down to Salisbury uh, towards Sarum. And it makes a dog leg around that great valley. So out here on the east side of the county. The next major work that Revilius undertook was this book called The High Street, which was commissioned by a publisher called um, Noel Carrington. And Revilius did the illustrations and J.M. Richards wrote the text. It's sort of a, a, a hymn to the high street. So nothing changes really. Uh, a slightly different view of the high street from the one we have today. And these wonderful illustrations of different shops on the high street. Now. What Noel Carrington then had the idea of using Revilius, of asking Revilius to create a children's book. And this had been inspired by um, some of the, uh, some books that had come through from the Soviet Union. You may remember I mentioned Peggy Angus, who had the house at Furlongs near to Lewis. She had visited um, Moscow in 1930 and had come back full of um, admiration for what the Soviet Union was achieving. And the, they published a whole series of children's books in editions of hundreds of thousands using cheap lithograph lith lithographic printing. This one is called Post. And you can see here, um, you know, letters and, and trains, very much appealing to young children, but encouraging them to read. This was part of a major literacy dr drive in the Soviet Union which was change, changing the way that Soviet Union worked. And so Carrington was able to persuade his publishers to create what was going to be a new series. This is um, one uh, dating to slightly later, but it, gives, it reminds you of what the Puffin series was all about. Um, meant for children, written and illustrated by leading artists and writers of the day, so the really high quality content, but produced very cheaply. And Carrington asked Revilius to do the illustrations for one that would focus on the chalk downland. 
Um, and he gave Revilius a, a rough out, a blank of the book, which is well, about that size. Um, and it's got it's exactly the same size and the right number of pages for one of these puffin books. And Revilius went away and started sketching out his ideas of how that might work. And this was 1939. Um, war had just broken out. And the choice of this particular topic was to um, was part of uh, the move to encourage patriotism, to celebrate the English, and I use that the word English very carefully, the English landscape as part of the, uh, the propaganda drive. He thought it was just spot on for the mood of the time. So Revilius went on a lightning tour of um, in the southern England in uh, December 1939 and created a series of watercolours that were to be the illustrations of the book. So here you can see the Vale of the White Horse, um, the White Horse at Uffington, um, silhouetted there on the landscape. Now, this is a view you can't see in reality. Um, the view of the horse is from uh, is really from uh, the uh, the ridge over on the right hand side, so it's a combination of views showing what perhaps what, how the white horse should have looked rather than how it actually did. And again, I'd like to highlight the um, the, the context, the uh, the textures here. See how Revilius has created the stems of grass and then created the texture heading down the hill, in contrast to the textures of the next ridge behind, and then the, the hill behind that. Rather unusually for Rivulius, there's no suggestion of the 20th century in here, although this line here is actually that of a road. And then when you visit um, Uffington, you can see the white horse on the summit of the hill here. This is more or less the view that he painted, but the view he was looking at it from was down here on this ridge, we're on a different ridge completely. Because of course you can't see the white horse properly from the ground. It's really can only it can be much better seen from the air. Uh, this is another of the watercolors he did, this 1939. Um, this is train window. And this is uh, here you see um, a view from the train window, chalk downland. And of course, the Westbury White Horse, on the, uh, the silhouette on the on the downs. This is interesting for a number of reasons, not least of which is that the White Horse was a later edition. In her biography, autobiography, Teresa Gerwood talks about how she tore up a couple of other paintings and sort of um, collaged them together to make this finished work. And so you see the Westbury White Horse, that is actually a cutout and has been collaged on top to make the view. And the hills, the downs are not those of Westbury. The downs are actually those of the, um, the area around Furlongs between Lewis and Eastbourne in Sussex. And the other remarkable fact about this one is that you can see it very closely relates to um, a wood engraving that Terza Garwood, uh, Revilius's wife, created in 1939. Eric had taught at the Eastbourne School of Art and Terza, his wife, had been one of his pupils and you can see how talented she was. Um, and you can see in the background here, it's also third class. In the background, you can see again the downs between Lewis and Eastbourne and this is the um, uh, chalk pit just outside Furlongs, and that might even be the house at Furlongs. Oh, so, sorry, that was meant to be a, re a reminder of the, um, the aerial view of Uffington Whitehall. Sorry, that was in the wrong place. The other thing to remind you is that in the 1930s, there was a great movement to open up the landscape. Um, the the um, the barbed wire fences that Rivalia shows a reminder of the fairly recent enclosure of open downland. 
and which then stopped people exploring the landscape. And this is the context in which you had the mass trespass of Kinder Scout. And this wonderful photo shows a meeting of the Westbury, of the Ramblers Association at Westbury White Horse and really sort of highlights that challenge to the, um, the enclosure of the landscape. And then, of course, that's the setting for the Westbury horse, um, the one of the most famous of Rivelius's works and the one that's on the poster for the exhibition. Dating to 1939, again, part of this rapid you know, lightning tour of the south of, of um, the Downlands. And this is, uh, you know, the, this is absolutely gorgeous with the train in the, land, in the landscape to give that sense of depth. The different treatment of the near ground with the mole hills with the scattering scatterings of chalk the, the lines um, the soil creep emphasizing that different the perspective and the 3d nature of the watercolor and of course the sign another uh, indication of the 20th century in a fairly timeless landscape and this is that view today um, taken a couple of week, uh, couple of weeks ago with lots of hang gliders, never seen so many. Unfortunately, the sign has gone, uh, but otherwise, in many ways, the landscape is the same. And this line of hedge, this hedge line here, is the line of the railway. Uh, though I, unfortunately, I didn't get to train when I was uh, when I was there. Other works he and he painted a number of other works to go into the into the uh, the book as illustrations, including the Wilmington Giant. Um, again, one of his favourite scenes, and you can see here the the chalk pit. This has actually been relocated to make a more impressive um, uh, to to make a, a more impressive uh, scene. And. As this was in 1939, it was after the outbreak of war, war, but during the phony war, it's worth remembering the position of the barbed wire fences here. They don't just remind you of uh, the trespass of the mass trespasses of the Ramblers. These also remind you of the First World War and the barbed wire in the trenches. So really, that's a really somber reminder. The the book that I was talking about, the this sort of dummy book, um, was put up for sale um, in 2012. Um, it had lain undiscovered for many years, um, more or less since Rivelius died. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be able to raise the funds to buy it at auction. Rivelius, as many of you will know, um, after 1939 became, sorry, in, in 1940, he became a war artist and was posted to a number of places, including Scotland. Um, and he also created a very famous set of watercolours of the defences of the, the South Coast, uh, particularly in Sussex and Kent. And we have a number of those in the exhibition. He never completed the, uh, the Puffin book. And this was, and his rough out was sent to Noel Carrington. Um, or finished the watercolors that were to go into the book in, 19, in by February 1940. But by then he was already um, he had already been commissioned into the army as a war artist, and he never completed it. But the this book does have most wonderful evocation of what the book may have looked like, and you see he's posted in photographs of his watercolors to show how they would work. And you see here how it says text. Others say things like Silbury Hill and Barrows and Hill Forts, giving a real indication of what it might have looked like. And you, so you see here the Westbury White Horse, um, the fellow of the White Horse at Uffington. And this one is uh, the White Horse at Uffington, which greeted King George as he made his way to Weymouth. And then, of course, the Westbury White Horse is the star of our exhibition. And I hope if you haven't already been to visit it, you'll come and, and see the exhibition. Um, and that's, that's, that's it. That's Rivelius in Wiltshire. I'm happy to try and answer any questions if anyone has, has any. Uh, and I'll just take a couple of moments to have a quick glug of tea.
So if you'd like to ask a question, if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom and just type in your question. So we've got one from Chris, um, perhaps a silly question, they rarely are, but and not Wiltshire related, but do art historians and James in particular have any inkling as to where Rivelius' art would have gone, how it would have developed had he survived the war? I'm thinking techniques and subjects. Yeah, well, I think Chris, as you say, I think um, probably James is the person to ask that to, but I think you can look at, um, you know, and I'm no art historian, but I think you can look at the work that um, Edward Borden, Piper, and um, what else was I thinking of? Borden, Piper, there's another one. Where they went, where sort of where they went to, um, which was following, oh, and, and Nash, which is very much following along the same lines, um, but and sort of particularly Borden, he really had established a way of working that became very popular. I think one of the other things that's quite interesting on that is that, of course, Rivelius designed a coronation mug in 1937 for Wedgwood. And that, of course, was, the design was revived and updated in 1953. And the work of the um, the work of Borden and other artists in the um, um, the exhibition, name, the Festival of Britain, was very much influenced. Was a continuation of the work of the 1930s. I think, as many of the other artists would have done, I think they would have struggled, to put it mildly, in the, by the time of the explosion of different art styles in the 1960s. Um, but I th so I think that would have been quite a challenge. But it was interesting to think if he had sort of gone back more to the roots, his roots and his rooted interest in um, the work of the early 19th century watercolorists. That's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Um, CMHK has said, what other galleries show Eric Revillius? was a bit of a clue in where we would have been fortunate enough to be able to borrow some of the uh, the works from, uh, from for our um, our exhibition. There are a number of key collections. The first is Towner in Eastbourne. Um, they have an amazing collection and they have a Revillius room, so they've always got Revillius works on show. <coughs> the other, I would... Um, Encourage, encourage you to go and see is the Fry Art Gallery in Saffron Morden. Um, and that is the real centre for the work that Eric produced when he was living in Essex and the work of the other great Bardfield artists. Those are the two standout places where you're guaranteed to see Rivellius works. There's an extensive collection of his war, um, his, the works he created when he was a war artist excuse me, in the Imperial War Museum, but generally that's not on display. But as you can, you will see, they've been very generous in loaning to our exhibition. And then, of course, Aberdeen, um, where there's the train landscape, which unfortunately we weren't able to, uh, to include in the show. Oh, and thinking about it, another one, if you're heading out west in Brecon, um, at the what's called EGAR, which is the um, Brecon Museum. They've got a fantastic Rivellius uh, in their collection there. Uh, it's worth remembering the, the museum there is in the former, um, uh, uh, was it uh, Shire Hall, which was designed by the same artist, that, uh, same architect that designed the, um, the size court in Devizes. Oh, Chris Thackeray has said the last white horse with a rider. Where was that? That's Osmington, which is in the hill in the downs just above Weymouth. Um, yeah, foreign territory of Dorset. Um, and Sea Hunter as a round of applause. Oh, that's very kind. Did he also create woodcuts of the landscape? Um, Yes, there are. Uh, in the exhibition, we've got a really interesting. There's a woodcut 
wood engraving of the church at Littlington in Sussex, and then there's a watercolour as well, so very much interrelated. Um, because wood engraving is though is quite a different technique, so you wouldn't create a, a landscape view you know, as a wood engraving, particularly the, the style that Revillius loved. Um, you need something sort of distinctive in the foreground to create the interest. The, back, the landscapes tend then to be backgrounds, like in the, um, uh, the, uh, the calendar that I mentioned, the almanac. And Jill has said, how driven were Revilius and Borden by pounds versus aesthetics? The need to sell, the need to live. Um, being an artist was quite precarious. Um, I think I mentioned, I can't remember if I mentioned, but the, um, the Morley College mural was absolutely critical for Revilius for his career because not only was it there that he met Geoffrey Fry, he was also given a large check uh, for com completing the commission. And he used that to show uh, Terza, uh, Terza Garwood's father uh, to persuade him to allow her to marry him. So without that check, they wouldn't have married. So it became rather important. Um, it was quite interesting because of his wood engraving, he had a good, he, he made quite a, a, a steady living. I would hardly say a good living. Um, but he then was building up his watercolours and he had a series of shows, um, three major solo exhibitions. The first one went quite well, didn't quite sell everything, but the second two he sold out completely. So he, was, he wasn't stupid and he very much had an eye to what would sell. Um, and he was always on the lookout for new opportunities, hence his interest in whether he might have been able to be commissioned to produce a shell guide and his interest in, interest in the puffin book. You could be unkind and say that perhaps his interest in the puffin book became rather less, um, uh, less pressing when he realised that there wasn't a huge amount of money in it rather than it being a good thing to do. So Sarah Gray has made a comment from Bucks. Um, Massingham lived in at Long Crendon, and his Chilton country also character, catches the character of the Chalklands. He wrote the intro, intro to Flora Thompson's Lark Rise to Candleford trilogy, which I hadn't realised. That, of course, is um, just Oxfordshire rather than Buckinghamshire, and commissioned another war, war artist, Tom Henkel, to record the Buck, Buckinghamshire trades in the late, 19, late 1930s. All the feel of interwar times, absolutely. Oh, Tom Henkel. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And Jane said, uh, asks, did Eric and Revilius and his wife collaborate on any artwork? Um, to the best of my knowledge, not really, but they worked quite essentially, uh, you know, it's very much a, a sign of the times. Uh, Terza really did very little work while um, until um, after really the after the end of the, first, the second world war she was busy, busy with looking after the house and children and that sort of thing um so she she obviously had an influence but when you read her her autobiography she she doesn't really seem to get very involved in the work one of the few comments is where she talks about train landscape and how she essentially rescued <laughs> two works that, that Eric might have torn up and thrown away by combining them. So it's sort of, I think he was quite, he worked in a very solo way, I think. Now, that's the last of the questions. And I say one would like to chip in with another. Um, while, while you're just thinking, if I can just highlight a couple of, uh, couple of talks we've got coming up. Uh, the first, 28th of October, Martin Carver talking about Sutton Who. The 4th of November, we'll be hearing about the Nebra Sky Disc, which is, going, which is one of the highlights of the forthcoming exhibition at the British Museum. That's on the 4th of November. And uh, James Russell, who's the real Rivolius expert, 
um, is going to be talking um, on the 2nd of December. Andrew has just typed in to say, do you know why Rivilius chose to become a war artist? Um, I'm just trying to dredge back into my memory. He, he, I think it's a combination of things. He, he was very much aware that other, that others in his generation were joining up. He knew John and Paul Nash, and he knew what they had done as war artists. And he realized that perhaps the best way he could contribute with his understanding of commercial work was to create works that would then help with the war effort and to join up as a war artist. Um, you know, we, we, we forget that when war was declared, the National Gallery was cleared out and all the paintings were placed in, in a place of safety, actually in a slate quarry in North Wales. And the National Gallery was turned over to exhibitions by war artists and uh, they had lunchtime concerts so the, the very much an aim to keep the cultural life going during wartime as part of the, um, the drive to uh, promote the war effort. And it's worth remembering that, um, I think I'm right, saying that uh, Churchill said, if we don't have art, then we don't know what we're fighting for. And so, and although I said the National Gallery, the same was happening throughout the country. They were touring exhibitions of the works of um, war artists encouraging people to do their bit to support the war effort. Um, and then someone has asked what are the circumstances of his death? So he had been uh, as a war artist he was posted to the RAF and um, was was sent to Iceland to record the work of the search and rescue uh, planes that were there and to look at the, um, particularly because of the convoys, because the convoys would um, come to the south of Iceland to, to group before heading across the Atlantic. And the planes were there to do what they could to um, rescue people from torpedo, um, boats that were torpedoed by U-boats. And he um, he arrived in Iceland and two days later um, chose to go out on a search and rescue mission. Um, and beyond that, we know no more. His plane didn't come back and um, just a single wheel from the plane that he was in was found a couple of days later, washed up on a beach. And that's all we know. So unless there's a last question, I think um, I'll call that it. Thank you all for coming. And I hope you found that interesting. And if those of you who haven't, I hope you'll come and visit the exhibition. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>